Welcome to In Focus. I'm your host, Enrique Medina. Today, join with us, we have a professor from our very own campus here at CSUF, a statistician, mathematics educator, researcher, and also director of CSUF Center for Computational and Applied Mathematics, CSUF professor Dr. Sam Bassetta was named the university's 2022 Outstanding Professor and has a passion for his work like no other. Dr. Bassetta, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. So just to start off, first and foremost, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do here on campus, and uh, give the viewers a little bit of a sense of uh, your background? I'll be glad to. My, uh, so I'm a professor of mathematics and statistics in the Department of Mathematics. Our department is located in a School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. And uh, what I do predominantly is uh, teaching, um, teaching graduate and undergraduate courses, uh, but I also am involved with uh, conducting research with our undergraduate and graduate students. And as you mentioned in your introduction, I'm in charge of a center called Center for Computational Applied Mathematics, or CCAM for short, uh, whose mission is to provide computational support for our students and faculty, whether it's a supercomputer cluster or uh, workshops about programming languages and so forth. And um, the center has been uh, very successful in the last few years uh, in providing and securing uh, new opportunities for our students. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit more about the center, maybe a little bit of its background, its history, and kind of what you guys are up to right now at this point? Sure. Um, so the center is about seven years old, or and um, uh, as I said, the job, the very definition of the center, its mission is to provide support uh, in any endeavor that is related to computation. And that's a vast arena of research and focus. Um, for example, uh, one of the types of activities that we do is that we try to bring new computational tools, powerful computational tools, uh, which we call uh, high performance computing machines or HPCs for sure. They're really supercomputers. Uh, people refer to them as clusters. Uh, they're very powerful computing tools that many users at the same time can use by log into that machine and run massive amount of computational uh, projects. For example, they can store big amount of data. We're talking about clouds of data, analyzing data, understanding patterns in data, and also fitting models to it. Uh, so that kind of support, that kind of infrastructural uh, work is one of the missions of the center. In addition to that, we try to educate uh, our students and faculty on the new ways of thinking about computation, the new methodology that comes out, uh, new programming languages, popular programming languages. For example, for those students uh, who might be familiar with computing, one of the most um, uh, popular um, programming uh, languages is uh, called Python. And this coming Friday, we provide a, a workshop on the introduction to Python. That's a type of activity that we provide. And lastly, the center is in charge of uh, giving opportunities to students and faculty to work together, uh, to define research projects, and con to conduct research together. Awesome. I want to touch up a little bit more on your background again. Um, more in regards to mathematics and statistics, is that something you always knew you wanted to get into? Tell me a little bit more about the background as far as your interest with that and how that came to be. Sure. Uh, I was a math major, but I wasn't sure what I would want to do with my life as an undergraduate student early on. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have access to a mentor or a role model who could guide me uh, in my educational interests 
or inspire me to or show me what are the ways that one can uh, you know exceed in in doing mathematics uh, it was pure random that I stumbled upon statistics and applied mathematics uh, I had a passion for social justice early on as a as a young person and I realized that uh, maybe statistics is an arena that one by analyzing data can help uh, fellow humans in having a better picture about global issues, local issues, and uh, what's the discourse in the current discourse in science, technology, and humanities. And uh, while I wanted to do all of that, again, I didn't know how to get involved. It was until the master's uh, when I got into the graduate school, I went to the master's program that I found the right people. I was a, gra a student at San Diego State University, which is another Cal State, and they were true mo uh, mentors and role models for me. And they showed me the power of statistical analysis in uh, further helping the society to make better decisions. And at that point, I became excited about this. I knew this is what I wanted to do. I went for my doctoral uh, studies. And uh, in the back of my head, I always wanted to be a professor. I saw the power of being a mentor, a teacher, a role model. And that became my number one mission in life, to be able to transmit knowledge and also help our students uh, to ex excel in life. Awesome, and let me touch up on that. As we stated earlier, you were CSUF's 2022 Outstanding Professor. Um, so for you, why, why is it so important to have such a large impact on these students' life, and especially in a field like statistics and mathematics, which sometimes can be very mentally draining? Absolutely. Um, it's the best part of the job. Um, and I'm fortunate to be in a school, an environment where that concept is shared by many faculty in different arenas or disciplines. Um, as a statistician, someone who looks at data, I've had the opportunity to interact with many of my colleagues, not just within mathematics and statistics group, but across the campus, mm, because many people, their research projects involve with analyzing and understanding data. So uh, every couple of while I get a phone call and an email from a colleague or a friend who says, you know, we have this data, come and help us. And it's in those uh, times that when I interact with colleagues across the campus, by which I mean professors, I realize how passionate they are in, in helping our students and in providing really top-notch education opportunities for our students in a variety of disciplines. So being in this campus, being in this environment, inspires me very much. Uh, while I was 100% sure that I wanted to be a professor uh, when I was a student, but it kind of made me, the being here at Cal State Fullerton, it made me feel stronger in my mission um, interacting with our students, especially our students. Um, there's something magical about students at Cal State Fullerton. Um, I've taught in other places, so I have data. <laughs> and I can attest to the fact that our students are truly unique. Um, they come here, they want to learn new ideas, they work hard, they're very professional and dedicated to educating themselves. And they sometimes, uh, they do this amidst many struggles in life. And that is the most rewarding part of being a teacher or a professor here. The ability to interact with students who are so passionate about learning. Right, and you know, you mentioned a lot of students go through struggles, uh, I know here on campus, we have a lot of students who are minorities and underrepresented. So can you tell me a little bit more about the impact you've been able to make in their lives and, and helping them out throughout their journey here at CSUF? Absolutely. And, and uh, I might add that that's the very special, especially rewarding feature of being a professor in, on this campus. 
as you mentioned, I've worked with many, many students where uh, they were not sure they can continue being a student because of the struggles outside the school. But uh, I genuinely believe the job of the professor is to go beyond uh, what is defined in the classroom and help them, help our students, uh, provide uh, further opportunities, whether it's extra hours outside the classroom, expanding their office hours, uh, outreach to families and communities, finding, looking around and finding resources that can help students. For example, if a professor looks about and finds a grant or a funding opportunity that can relieve uh, the students from some of their burdens, well, that's a really good thing because it provides the opportunity for that student not to worry too much about working two, three jobs outside the school and focus on their education. So it's a collective effort on the part of the mentor and the mentee together uh, in order to make sure uh, one can continue the path of education. That's, that was my own experience. I didn't come from a very uh, wealthy background or anything like that. Somebody in my educational uh, journey found uh, potentially uh, something interesting in me, helped me, guided me, and it was at that moment that I decided I have to give back and be part of this. It's genuinely exciting to be part of this sort of educational collective learning. Right, and you talk about all these opportunities and resources. I know you've been teaching here at Cal State Fullerton specifically since 2008. Obviously, I wasn't here in 2008. I was still a little kid, but uh, just to get a sense, how have you seen those opportunities grow both in mathematics and statistics and on campus for, for students? Um, broadly speaking, um, securing um, funding requires leadership. Um, it's something that the administration and the faculty side of the story has to go after and work hard on. Um, and that has been, I would say, a, an ever-increasing pattern. Uh, there is a lot of understanding, mutual understanding among, among our administrators and the faculty that um, while there is a set budget in terms of the operations associated with student affairs, but uh, we need to bring more resources. And there are a lot of national and international funding opportunities such as national grants through National uh, Science Foundation or National Institute of Health or other places where uh, a faculty or group of faculty can gather about, define a project in collaboration with their students, and then try to secure funding. Of course, uh, these types of grants are very much competitive. Many people, many faculty members across the country apply for them. So you're one of the very few who've been rewarded for this. But uh, if the idea is to genuinely go after these funding opportunities and secure them, you know, you keep trying. Maybe one out of ten is successful, but when it's successful, it's genuinely rewarding. So about those successes, is there one for you that in particular stands out throughout the time you've been here at CSUF? Yes, we um, won a, a, a grant from National Science Foundation, um, uh, I would say about two years ago, where we um, secured funding for uh, providing opportunities for our students to learn about data science. As you might know, data science is an ever-growing field or discipline um, in sciences, um, and the reason for that is uh, data is everywhere. We're surrounded by data. Uh, we constantly generate data as uh, citizens of the world. We, everyone uh, that you probably interact with has an access to a cell phone. Uh, uh, or searches internet, or um, when you visit a doctor, you know, they record the information somewhere in some data repository or data bank. And so we're consistently adding to the amount and quality of data that is out there. Thereby, there are people with the expertise and knowledge about how to tackle this 
massive amount of data, how to understand it, where are the patterns, uh, and how to utilize this data in order to make good decisions. That's the science of data or data science, which is really the crossroads between statistics, mathematics, computer science, and uh, some application, whether it's uh, biological or physical sciences or medical sciences or um, humanities, uh, arts, mm, you know, and TV production, there's always some variation of data analysis. Uh, producers across the world have to consistently think about how they could utilize limited budget in order to provide quality shows like yours. And so data scientists are uh, highly needed. And so we brought this grant and uh, we emphasize that our students are predominantly underrepresented and uh, in many cases underserved. And uh, if we convince the National Science Foundation that if they give us this money, uh, we can inspire uh, a cadre, a group, a cohort of students in a larger way. And I'm glad to report that this is the second year that the grant is running. Uh, it's in collaboration with UC Irvine and Cypress College, which is one of the community colleges in our neighbor in our region, and it's been wonderful. We uh, last year we had 20 um, scholars who went to UCI, did research, um, uh, presented their research in a major symposium, and I'm glad to report that some of those uh, are now being admitted by top-notch. PhD programs across the country. It's been a very inspiring uh, activity for us. And I should mention the name of my colleague, Dr. Jessica James, who's helping me with this grant. Awesome. Thank you very much to her. Um, I know you've mentioned pretty often that relationship between statistics and being able to make real life decisions. Is there any sort of project that you've worked on, um, maybe a certain research pro project that stood out to you? Um, anything within the last few years that stands out or maybe working with a student, a project that they've done that's really stood out? Yes, I should um, uh, mention our c ongoing current research on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you know, Alzheimer's is a brain de deficiency that predominantly affects older people, um, but it's very uh, frequent. Uh, one every three senior citizens in the country, there's a chance they might get affected by this uh, brain problem. And uh, it can have a heavy toll on not only the patient, the person, but their family. Um, uh, it's a progressive uh, deficiency, brain deficiency. What happens is that uh, multiple functions of or functionalities of different arenas or regions of brain stop uh, doing what they are supposed to be doing. And uh, the symptoms of it is that the person forgets things. It starts with forgetting the names of the loved ones and it um, goes progressively into not being able to do basic jobs or basic tasks of that any human being is supposed to be doing. And if you zoom out and think about how many people are struggling with this, uh, uh, and if you think about it from the perspective of providing health care to those people, it translates into millions and millions of dollars across the nation. So one of the things we're trying to accomplish with my colleague, Dr. Archana McElligot in the Health Department of Health Sciences, and Dr. Matt Kohonko in the Biology Department, um, is to provide education uh, on Alzheimer's disease. And as a data scientist, as a statistician, my job is to guide our students to look at the data, a massive amount of data that is out there in a public sector on people who have been diagnosed with this uh, uh, problem and try to find what variables, whether it's demographic variables uh, such as ethnicity or age or education, or whether it's behavioral variables such as their um, uh, uh, habits and lifestyles, how would these, um, uh, or diet, dietary intake, 
uh, how would all of these interact with or contribute to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's? And it's important because if, if as researchers we find something that is meaningful, then maybe we can provide that outcome to people in the uh, healthcare industry, and that obviously would allow them to make better decisions. Yes, as you suggested. They interconnect, yes, of course. Uh, one thing I do want to ask, just for the typical viewer, obviously there's so much that goes into that research, into a research project. Can you go a little bit more in depth as far as the process of, of literally from day one to whenever the research project is officially completed, just literally as much detail as possible, right? Uh, just go through the process of how it's like. Absolutely. Um, so for this particular Alzheimer's research, for example, um, our students, um, the team really consists of graduate and undergraduate students, predominantly undergraduate students. Our team uh, has access to a significantly large data repository um, uh, through National Institute of Health. That's called NAC, N-A-A-C. Um, this data set is very large. And the way it's composed, it's that many universities who do research on Alzheimer's collect data from their patients and contribute their data to this data bank, if you wish. And it's a public entity, meaning that any researcher who is interested in this subject matter can have access to that data. So we got the data. But that's only the beginning of the research because it's so much data, a uh, variety of data, data on uh, neuroimaging, the brain imaging. Uh, you know, you might have heard of MRI or fMRI, where's this machinery that a patient goes through it and it records the activities of the brain. It really provides a movie, uh, uh, a moving uh, frame, a uh, series of frames of the brain activities as a function of time. So that's part of the data, as I mentioned, demographic information, what ethnicity this patient comes from, how old are they, are they married, um, what is their education, is there a history in their family of Alzheimer's, for example. Um, and then a whole battery of tests when people are suspected to have some sort of a uh, variation of this disease where it's a mild version of it or a severe version of it. They go to a doctor and the doctor administers tests. For example, puzzle type stuff. Uh, how many um, animals can you recall in the span of 30 seconds? Things like that. And so it, all of this, if you have millions of patients, you know, contributes to a massive amount of data. So our number one task, a student's task, is to get this data, which is parked in some cloud in the sky, and bring it down and put it on their machines. Um, it has to be an optimal way to transmit that data to our computers or supercomputer. Um, and then they have to just go through this massive amount of data in the beginning and find interesting patterns. Uh, how would one go about even connecting or, uh, you know, uh, fusing data that is about brain recordings to ethnicity or doctor's visit? They are of different nature. What is the link that provides commonalities among these different types of data? So these are hard problems that students have to think about. And then once they develop their own variation of the data set, they begin to visualize data. You might have seen statistical visualizations through, I don't know, bar plots or pie charts and stuff like that that almost everybody's familiar with. But that's predominantly for simplistic, what we call univariate or bivariate data, uh, data that has easy structure, simple structure. But when data is very complex, even plotting it, providing some sort of a summary of it, becomes a significantly non-trivial task. And it's under those situations where our students have to consistently think about how, what methodologies are out there or what methodologies they can create in order to summarize this data. And after all of that, after they summarize data and they found some meaningful information in data, there begins the task of 
fitting statistical models, which is the next phase of the story. You might have heard of predictive models whose job is to predict potentially to some level of uh, confidence whether a person who has symptoms A, B, C, D, E is prone to have Alzheimer's soon or not. That type of prediction is very useful, again, for decision makers because they can inform the families that maybe this patient who is of certain age and is, you know, um, developing these symptoms, maybe this patient needs health care early on. And that, uh, from a bigger perspective of societal um, uh, uh, decision making is very, very important because then government can allocate resources uh, and education to the patient and the families before it gets a major issue and it's out of hand. Right. And like we've mentioned, this whole theme of connecting statistics to those big life, uh, to the real life problems, right? Um, it's important and also going into the importance of both statistics and real life issues. I know you on top of being a professor here on campus are also involved with other things. Of course, you have your own hobbies and other things you're in involved with. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Maybe some of the other things that you're also involved with? Sure. Um, well, as, as part of <laughs> hobbies, I've always been passionate about film uh, as, uh, as a medium, uh, intellectual medium. And so when I was a young person, um, you know, I started reading about film and, 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 and I became uh, fascinated by the intellectual discourse that is around cinema as a medium, as a creative medium. And, you know, I watched one way or another, I found ways to watch all these old movies of the masters of cinema from the 1920s, silent cinema predominantly was my passion, expressionistic cinema of Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, and then um, films of the masters of cinema, I don't know, Hitchcock or Bergman or other guys. And then I, I, I was so fascinated by this that I started writing about it, and I showed my work to some journal editor, and that person said, oh, this is good, and they started publishing it. And looking at it, so of course, many years back, um, Later, uh, it, it, the, some of those writings are very simplistic and naive, but but it has remained a passion uh, in, in my life to think about film uh, as a very powerful medium that has broad uh, impact on the society and its discourse and conversation with the world around it uh, at any given period of time. And that unto itself is also statistical because there's a lot of data. Uh, for example, one of the major, most famous, um, famous um, web engines for cinema is IMDb that you might have been familiar with. Uh, but there's a lot of data behind IMDb, right? All this uh, movies, they come with all sorts of features, whether it's the production side of it, uh, the gross, uh, you know, from the box office perspective, the cast, the crew, and then, of course, the, the reception uh, from the public and critics. So if you think about that, one movie becomes a point of uh, data analysis. So if you accumulate millions of data points that are in this data repository, there you go, that's a statistical problem to deal with. Right. Um, I, I do want to go back. Of course, to the Achievement 2022 Professor of the Year here at Cal State Fullerton. As far as any advice you'd give to any other professors here on campus or just educators in general, what type of advice would you give them as far as making sure they can enhance the student experience? Yeah, I don't think I'm at the level to give advice to my colleagues. I'm mostly interested in receiving advice. But, um, you know, um, as I mentioned, what I can uh, uh, tell you with a good level of confidence is that majority of our faculty here on campus are uh, genuinely interested in what they do. They've come to Cal State Fullerton. This is a very special environment. It's a very unique um, institution of higher learning. And as I said, you know, throughout 20 years of being involved with, um, with uh, um, uh, universities, 
uh, I have a lot of data. So I can tell you that it, the environment at Cal State Fullerton is really special. Um, faculty really want to help students. So it's all about passion. You know, you have certain body of knowledge as a result or a byproduct of years of working hard, educating yourself, going to, you know, top-notch institutions and acquiring a degree. And then when the moment you become a professor, identified as a professor, uh, your job is to really transmit that knowledge to the next generation of scholars and, and, and students. And we're very good in that. I, I mean, if you go to our classrooms, it's, there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of interaction between faculty and students. It's one of those institutions of higher learning that there's not much of a gap or alienation between the professor and a student body. Um, at least I can tell you that in our department, the mathematics department, office doors are always open. People come and visit and sit and chat with their professors. Professors work mostly as mentors rather than just being a teacher in the classroom. I'm curious to see, you talk about that next generation of students. In regards to that next generation in terms of mathematics and statistics, is there any trends you kind of expect to see a little bit more in the future? Um, just, uh, I, I guess overall, uh, how is the field going to change over the next few years and decades? A yes, a lot of discussion in currently in statistics is related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Everyone in the world has heard ne by now mm, this term chat GPT, which is a, a, an AI engine, artificial intelligence engine, that has a lot of data in it and it tries to build an interactive discourse with its audience. S you know, if you go and type, um, who is Sam Bassetta, it probably will uh, look across the web uh, and scrapes data and, and uh, it's been trained to put together seemingly coherent paragraphs and sentences that describes who Sam Bassetta is based on what it found on the net. Um, this process of so-called learning using data in its heart is a statistical problem. Um, there are a series of techniques called machine learning where this engine, the machine, the chat uh, concept, uh, receives data, but it becomes better and better in doing things and it collects more data. That's called machine learning. Now, the statistician's job is to make sure that this is done with a grain of salt, meaning that the audience, the uh, users, and the people who design these types of engines, to which I'm somewhat critical, um, are aware of the fact that it's not a deterministic machine, meaning that its predictions or convictions or dialogue with the user is not 100% uh, right. It's based on what it could find off of internet. And if internet is filled with bad data on a subject matter, that chat GPT will uh, give you bad information for sure. Well, Dr. Bassetta, thank you so much for joining us today for this interview. It was great to get some more perspective both on s mathematics, statistics, how we relay that to real world problems. Personally, for me, that's something uh, you know, you don't really think about it that way, but you're completely right in how that research is conducted, and there's so much that goes into it. It was a pleasure to get to know a little bit more about that. And of course, your past both here at CSUF and also your leadership being the 2022 Professor of the Year here at Cal State Fullerton. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and honor to be invited and participate in this program. Thank you. And thank you for joining us to discuss Dr. Bassetta's accomplishments and his work. We want to thank you, Dr. Bassetta, for sharing insight and a huge congratulations on being the school's 2022 Outstanding Professor. Until next time, I'm Enrique Medina. This has been In Focus.